I work hard for my results and I need my diet dialed in. The RP Diet app tells me what to eat to keep me on track and offers suggestions for changes based on my responses, giving me the freedom to choose my path. A personal digital diet coach for less than $15 a month? Yeah, that works. And looks like we're rolling. We roll in. All right, folks, welcome back. Sorry for being a little off schedule that this week. That was my bad. I forgot to bring it up last time when I asked Mike, hey, what are you doing next week? Are we good? I forgot that I was actually traveling, so my bad. Number two, apology. Sorry if I'm digitizing or if the quality is not great this week because I am using the Wi-Fi and my headphones rather than a microphone, so it's going to be a little lower quality than usual this week, so sorry in advance. And by that, he means the quality of the questions and answers is going to be worse intellectually. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right, folks. So big housekeeping item. We are doing a tiny bit of restructuring. And here is the deal. We are going to be collecting questions from RP Plus, And we are going to be answering them on this webinar every week, just like normal. We are going to be posting those answers to RP Plus every single time in the webinar section. But a few additions. We'll also be posting these on YouTube, on the Renaissance Periodization YouTube channel. So you could say the Sports Scientist podcast is sort of back, but in the form Ooh. of just webinar stuff for RP Plus. And we're going to take approximately three questions per week off of the YouTube channel. So as soon as the first video goes up, if you watch this and you're a YouTube subscriber to RP, shoot a question right into that description. And then the next week, we'll try to get three questions answered. We're going to do them just like we do the RP Plus questions. Super in-depth, super awesome. Um, here's the thing, though. Until and unless it takes us longer than like two hours to do these things, we're going to answer every single RP Plus question for sure. And we're only going to answer three YouTube questions a week, which is to say very low percentage of a YouTube question. So if you want your questions answered, RP Plus is the way to go. And if you get frustrated that you've been asking questions on YouTube and no one's answering, you have a straight line to the answer for $10 a month. Listen, James and I have nasty drug and hooker habits. We have to get this money. Um, please give us money. Um, but in any case... Now, but sound like a true addict. We have to get this right. money. <laughs> Must have money. Um, there is a potential down the road that the uh, RP Plus webinars become super duper popular. But I don't know how likely that is. If we get in excess of about 17 questions, depending on how long they are, from our RP Plus members, we're still going to do three YouTube questions every week but we might cap it at around 17 questions per week from the RP plus members. And then we are going to change the terms of service and conditions for RP plus. And you can continue to subscribe if you'd like. And if you really hate the following, then you just unsubscribe. No worry. We love you anyway. The terms of service will then be, this is not the case yet. It may never become the case, but just a heads up that if your RP plus membership gets you the forums, it gets you all the videos every week of RP plus and it gets you access to all this stuff. And it gives you the highest possible probability that James and I will answer your question, right? But some questions we might have to pare down or eliminate uh, because we want to get to all the best questions. So we might just take the top 17 questions every week. So it might be the case that RP Plus is popular enough that we get 25 questions on RP Plus every week. That means we're going to answer 17 of them and the rest we're going to pare out. Now, here's the categorization, and James might have an addition to this. We are going to take questions that do not fit the following categories. Have not been asked before in excessive number of times. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just like if it's been asked a bunch of webinars, just watch the old ones and you'll get them. If it's a question that is brutally fucking obvious that you could Google, like how many grams of protein do I need per day for the love of God? <laughs> um, a question that is um, incredibly personalized programming advice that we usually don't answer anyway, but we'll do not even address the question because we'll usually say, hey, you know, or, you know, whatever your nickname is on here, you know, hey, you know, dildo guy 46. This is a good <laughs> question. It's a good question, but we don't have, because, you know, people will ask a question like, here's exactly my program to the letter. 
in no, I, I'm interested in no theoretical guidance of what to do next. I'm interested in exact specifics. Do I do four sets or five sets next week? That's a coaching question. To answer really well, we'd have to coach you. And RP has a coaching service. There's plenty of other great coaching companies, 3DMJ, tons of other great stuff. Just hire a coach. Um, so those kinds of questions might not see the light of day as much. Um, and I think lastly, questions that are sort of easily verifiable through other RP products like our books, et cetera. Now, if you ask a question about a concept in the book, oh my God, we'll answer it. If you ask a deep intellectual question about a concept that you haven't read in the book that exists in the book or that's not in any books, we'd love to solve it. But if it's like, hey, what's your guys' thoughts on nutrient timing? Well, very published, very public. So you just did easy Google. Like if it's an easy Google, we're probably just not going to answer it. If it's incredibly in-depth personal, we're probably not going to answer it. Um, and if it's been asked a bunch before, we might give lip service to it and then sort of go on, or we might not answer it all. Like it might even not make the selection. For now, we're answering all questions, um, uh, but that may be the situation later. So you think, oh, why the hell am I still paying for RP Plus? Because you know, your chances of getting an RP Plus question answered, especially if it's, if it's a good question, is going to be like, uh, like 99% or 95%. Uh, your chances of getting answered on YouTube is going to be, well, you know, three questions out of the probably hundreds of comments we'll get on the videos after a few months. So not great. Um, James? Yeah, no, that, I think you nailed it. Uh, I'm leaning forward as if I have a microphone. That's just how I'm used to doing this. Um, uh, I, I think that like with the YouTube thing, too, I, I think you say that in a lot of your interviews. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, also, it might be one of those things where it's like a zero to three questions because a lot of the questions I'm assuming we get on YouTube are in the same categories as things that Mike already described. <laughs> sure. like, sure. So like, should I do this? Or like, um, you know, and so here's some examples of things we might not answer anymore. It's like, um, what books do you recommend? What do you do to be productive? What kind of stuff should I know about grad school? Those are things we might just not really answer anymore because we've answered them a bunch, right? Other questions like, should I add intensity or volume? That's a good question, but we've beaten it to death on previous webinars, right? So we might kind of glaze over some of those other ones where you get into more meaty, like good, thoughtful questions, then we might pick a few of those out every week. But um, we're not going to take shitty questions from YouTube over good questions from our people. Great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So zero to three weekly questions from YouTube. And if you're on YouTube and you're like, oh, YouTube only asked two questions. Why didn't I get mine answered? Well, because your question sucked. Um, and probably you suck. I'm just kidding. We love everyone. Give us your money. Um, <laughs> you, you may want to, just for total transparency, why are we doing this? Um, because it provides the same or very similar level of service to our wonderful RP plus people, but it makes our intellectual advice like sort of public and it lets other people see it, which is a great service because I'll, I think a lot of people, maybe many of you watch the webinar, even if you don't ask questions, because it's just a lot of wisdom that we pour out here, whatever wisdom bullshit that we make up on the spot. But like, you know, a lot of our, yeah, a lot of our best intellectual <laughs> work is just on, doesn't see the light of day. Um, and through YouTube, it'll be super public, which is great, but it still conserves the RP plus uh, payment structure to be like super worth your time if you want to pay us. Um, so that's the situation. Um, and Yahoo, if you don't want your questions out in public, uh, either write down a fake name or don't ask us private questions uh, in RP plus. So just a quick yeah. reminder, there's no, there never was an expectation of privacy, by the way, it was never in the contract, but, um, for sure not now. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point too. And there's also a forum if you want to ask questions, but you don't want us to like announce that you made this question. There's a yep. forum that you can go on as well. Yep. Yep. Our All right. expert forum, right? Let's do it. Thanks for your time and for the housekeeping guys. Let's get to business. I will read off the screen as long as you pull it up. Perfect. Is Daniel Hacker first? Yeah. All right. So also hello, YouTube. I guess we should say that um, if, you wonder, if you're confused about what this is, James uh, and I are sports scientists and we answer questions about sports science. So we're going to do this every week as long as we're not dead. Um, all right. Which might not be that long. Frankly. That might not be that long. There's a probability distribution about that number. It's not. I almost got positive. taken out by a, a gaggle of wild turkeys today. That would be a terrible way to go. They were fucking huge. I was driving down the highway here, and I was like, boo, 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 boo. And, oh, man. <laughs> That's a flashback from Lo the Los Bekistani Wars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, what, okay, right, right. real quick before, before we get into the questions. What is the UN, like, panel of eight countries like? that like meeting room when Turkey and Lozbekistan are in the same. Oh, room. tensions are running high. The, the Moldovian <laughs> uh, uh, candidates just like walk out, but uh, they can't deal with the tension. It's too much. <laughs>
<laughs> Luckily, the representative uh, from Hoffmanistan is a good mediator. <laughs> for sure. You do that awkward pose for the picture where both parties are sort of smiling. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, Peace. And both Pakistan. Yep. All right. Daniel Hacker, a man that exclusively penetrates deep, secure internet networks because he's a oh, hacker. I was, I was holding, I was, I was getting nervous there for a second. I was like, oh man, he started with penetrate. This can't Rough be start. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> he says, is there any utility in fighters doing spinal flexion slash direct abdominal training? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Especially weighted because a ton of kicking is abdominally uh limited um when you do a lot of jujitsu uh, there's a lot of stuff where you use your abs to both pull your knees towards you rapidly and to pull yourself up to your opponent rapidly there's a bunch of sitting up sweeps that you can do um so yes there's tons of utility james and i think i think even more so for like mma where there, there's the cage involved and you can actually use the cage to like push yourself up or to try and shirk your yeah. opponent off there's a lot of good advantages to using that spinal flexion with the cage um yeah. but i mean it's it's like anything else like it's not that you should do it necessarily it's that uh, there needs to be a need for you to do it and that's a sport where i think you can make a strong case that there is a need for it in many instances yeah similar question chad and i think you guys too question mark have talked about having twisting movements as a staple in a fighter's strength conditioning program can you list some awesome twisting movements james um i don't really use a ton of twisting movements a lot of the twisting you get comes from the training that you do like if you i should probably switch the screen back and forth every now and again eh? um a lot of the training you get just comes from like throwing kicks throwing punches doing uh like your judo your grappling throws you get a lot of training stimulus from that when you go into resistance training, really there's only a couple that I recommend, and that's some form of like a cable twist, like arms extended, um, horizontal position cable. I should probably put it on myself here. Uh, there we go. You know, arms out, cable twist kind of thing, just against resistance. Nothing too crazy. Just do it both, both sides for sets of between like 10 and 20 if you're just trying to strengthen those muscles up. Nothing fancy. And then once you move into more of your power explosive training, you might do some like uh, ball throws. The yeah. thing with, you, with the ball throws is a lot of people focus too much on the shoulder and the arm portion, and they're trying yeah. to win. Right? You've got to get used to pivoting with your hips and your trunk. So you get a lot of hip, a lot of trunk. That's okay. You want to minimize the arm. The arm's just there to hold the ball and eventually release it. Yep. Yeah. That's it. That's the worst is when people turn technical twisting movements into rep cardio. And it's just a terrible way to do cardio. And you're just like, you're training your biceps in a really shitty way. Yeah. And the thing too, is like the twisting movements put a lot of surprising stress on like your back muscles. And what yeah. I've noticed is you got it when you're doing the kicks, when you're doing adding twist training, you'll notice that your back will be one of the first things that starts to become a limiting factor, which is not a good. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question from Daniel is if you're not competing uh, and just as James has aptly named the professional, <laughs> what do you think about keeping a cap on your top end weight during mass phase and just trying to reach that weight at a crisper and crisper look each time you mass? Say you've reached a certain top end weight of 18% body fat. Maybe next time you try to get to 16, next time at 14, rough numerical estimates, but you see my point. I think it's a great idea until and unless you decide that you want more mass or you want it faster. At some point, your top end of mass is like 10 to 12%, and that means you're cutting out almost the entire productive 10 to 17% out. Um, so at some point, you're going to be really lean at the body weight you want, and your mass is going to be a joke. So then you need to expand it back up. So I think it's great, especially if you're like, you know, I, it's not any genetic cards for me, slash it would take everything um, uh, for me to get up to 250 so all I'm going to do is get up to 240, cut down to 220, get up to 240, cut down to 222, get up to 240, cut down to 224. And then eventually I'll be like 230 super fucking lean. And my mass phases will just be like a relaxed eating time when I'm up closer to 240. Uh, I think that's totally cool. But um, you just have to understand that if you have any aspirations to really push the limits, this is not a compatible thing. Yeah. And just to add on top of that. So in that case, you're, you're instead of having a, and making gains in body weight over time is not a linear thing, but just for the sake of discussion, it's more of a linear thing, like over time, in this case, that strategy immediately causes an asymptote, right? Where you're basically capping your gains off at some point, And then the gains really start having diminishing uh, returns deliberately, which is fine. That's a completely fine trade-off. It's just something you should be aware of. So it's not one of those things where each mass phase, you're going to be gaining tons and tons of weight, as Mike said, because you're not taking advantage of the time at those different body fat levels. You're just going to be cutting it shorter and shorter and shorter each time, making less and less progress. 
but that's fine. If you don't, if you, if it's not a huge priority, not a big deal. Yep. All right. What is next? William, William Reed sounds like a motherfucker in the uh, Revolutionary War or some shit. Mm-hmm. Like William Reed, I can script you to serve in our Continental Army. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Win. <laughs> William yeah, Reed. Right. That's a different adult film star. All right. <laughs> William Reed says, hey, guys, I'm on antipsychotic meds, and they make me unbelievably psychotic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Damn, that, these don't work at all. <laughs> They're not working. <laughs> They're pro-psychotic meds. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm on antipsychotic meds, and they make me unbelievably hungry. I have a very hard time losing weight because of it. Um, I just tried a mini cut after six weeks of massing and I had to stop less than a week in from my hunger going nuts because I have hard time dieting on these meds. I'm thinking of doing slower, longer masses, gaining 0.5 pounds a week and then slower, longer cutting phases, losing more than one pound a week. Would this be a good idea? Is there a better way? I think that would be a great start to an idea. Another thing is if you haven't checked out the anti-hunger strategies, there's a bunch of lectures on YouTube where I talk about them uh, for free. But if you want to pick up the RP diet book, there's an entire chapter on hunger management and you can integrate all of that stuff more aggressively and more quickly into your diet than normally would happen. And you can really get ahead of that stuff and uh, just make sure you're not. So there's two factors, how much weight you lose total over the stretch of your cut and how fast you try to lose it. So uh, if you go easy on both of those, then you're in uh, in a good spot, James. Yeah. And it, it might be such that you could probably run your mass phases pretty normally. And I think you, you, what you're basically saying is like running a pretty normal mass. But I, I, my only point being, you wouldn't have to necessarily draw the mass phases out longer unless you're just jobbing out every single time because yeah. of the rebound hunger. But I think drawing the cut phases out, uh, like you described and what Mike already described, is definitely a good idea. Yeah. All right. The great Anthony Drotnell says, hey, guys, I mentioned <clears throat> wherever possible is an excuse for pretty much everything. Much of the last 18 months have seen me slowly dropping weight due to several injuries and lifestyle time constraints. As of my lowest weigh-in six weeks ago, I was down about 25 pounds compared to February 2017. I started mm-hmm. giving away my things because I don't think I'm going to make it for long. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Definitely some lean mass lost, but also a fair amount of fat. I've been able to squeeze in a few good training muscles over this period to regain some lost muscle, and I'm now at least noticeably leaner than I have been in many years. I also haven't done any specific cardio training at all during that time. Oh, I lost my place. Oh, okay. But during a checkup with my doctor six weeks ago, my vitals came back as resting heart rate of 55 beats per minute. Nice. Blood That's pressure, great. 122 over 70. Notice will be better than in 2017 when I also wasn't doing any cardio. Losing weight clearly has tremendous health benefits, 100,000%. Um, mm-hmm. There's a reason we wrote that book about that. Um, as long as enough muscle mass is retained for health, which probably isn't that much. No, it's not. Um, but to what extent would these effects be expected if to be a result of specifically losing fat versus quite simply losing weight in general. I suspect it's the latter, given how powerful this change has been. Uh, if I had to do a real, real cursory estimate of what the, um, would be the result if this study was directly done, I think probably losing weight uh, is 60 to 70% of the health benefit and uh, losing pure fat versus muscle is another uh, 30 to 40% benefit. So what I would say is if someone said, hey, I lost a bunch of weight, and they like it turns out they lost some muscle and you know they lost some fat but you know just lost a lot of weight in general i would expect their health to be very very significantly improved but if someone loses all predominantly or exclusively fat and loses uh, almost as much weight but not quite they actually turn out even healthier but not by this insane margin so a lot of times and this is coming from a lot of the reading the literature but also working with a bunch of people who have either lost a lot of fat but not a lot of weight or um, sometimes with simultaneous muscle gain, which really sort of magnifies the uh, weight versus fat uh, question. And some people who have just lost a lot of weight, and that means fat and muscle. And what I will say is uh, people who lose more weight win almost every time, but they don't win by a huge margin. And if you just lost fat and didn't lose a lot of weight, you do get healthier, but it's not night and day crazy like losing weight. Of course, the best way to get healthier is to lose the maximum amount of weight and gain slash maintain all of your muscle. And then you just turn into like a heart rate 40 fucking kind of like blood pressure, 100 over 60 kind of person. So Yahoo. 
that sounds spot on to me. I was tr trying to think of a scenario and I ended up like getting too lost in a daydream where I was thinking about somebody who was <laughs> maintaining their weight, but losing like all muscle and gaining fat, but to maintaining their weight. And I was like, that would be really Stop unhealthy. training, keep eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Very unhealthy. Just, yeah. just eat all fats and stop training. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I think it's more, I think it's uh, more heavily blast on the weight side rather than the fat side, but losing yeah. fat certainly has its place as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. What's really amazing to me is the carryover. This improved cardio conditioning is provided away training. I know I have fourth week of a mass phase and recovery from high volumes in a way I haven't since. Well, the last time I was this light back when I actually did do regular cardio, I'm clearly far better conditioned now than I have been for some time as I'm able to take far shorter rests and let the reps drop off like Mike recommends without gassing out or tanking my recovery at the Calgary seminar. I mentioned how I have to do specific cardio to prepare myself for high volume leg training or else I get headaches from exertion. This is no longer the case at all. In fact, the difference is so stark that it is unavoidably evident that I simply wasn't uh, appropriately conditioned for hypertrophy training over the last few years. Ironically, the reason I cut cardio in the first place is that it was interfering with my masses and my weight shot up as soon as I dropped it. But it didn't occur to me that I'd lose the conditioning and then need to get back to some later point. Maybe I wasn't a fat piece of shit on the outside, but I clearly was a fat piece of shit on the inside. <laughs> In my heart, where it really matters. <laughs> That's right. Literally in your heart. But actually in your heart. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, you're, they do a cardiac scan. They're like, you're a fat piece of shit right there where it really is going to get you. Um, like, oh, doc, you really, you really busted my chops here. No, really, look at this cardiogram. There's you can fat it. in there. You're going to die. Um, so the important question now is, how can I retain this newfound conditioning now that I'm going to slowly mass my way back up to previous body weights? You can't. That's the short answer. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Is it possible to train the conditioning by keeping up this higher density short rest training without additional cardio? No. Or at some point, am I going to need to keep adding cardio back in, even if physically during maintenance periods and mini cuts? Maybe, not necessarily. Maybe, maybe not. Should I gradually begin to reintroduce cardio once I find the shorter rests I've been taking are becoming increasingly difficult or are there better indicators? There are good indicators, but you may not want to uh, add in cardio. Let's just say that. Let me finish this real quick and I'll just say what I have to say. I realize these are basic questions from a team sport perspective, but they're honestly something I never considered from my purchase perspective. I just want to make sure I don't make the same obvious mistakes again, just like how it didn't occur to me. Uh, that I could be insufficiently conditioned for massing, but I absolutely was. So, so here's the thing, uh, Tony. It's one of the situations where um, there are a variety of uh, things that um, there are problems that come along with any intervention, and then there is a list of mitigators you can impose, but almost all those mitigators have limits and they have costs. So there's a certain amount of mitigation that you're just not going to want to do because it's going to be sort of fighting the other way. So I think, uh, you know, massing means you're going to get into worse shape. It doesn't mean you have to get into the kind of shape that you can't train. The first mitigator is mass slower and take more maintenance breaks and take more mini cuts, okay? Like if you've put on five pounds of muscle a year, that's really great. That means technically speaking at most, the most you'd ever have to gain in any one stretch of the year, maybe seven pounds at a time. And then you can lose three or four and then gain another seven or lose three or four. You'll gain five pounds of muscle that year, but going up seven pounds is not the same thing as going up 20, but it still leads to great muscle gains. Um, doing it slower, letting yourself adjust. Cardio, I think I take James's view on this, like to heart is like, it keeps you healthy if you do a little bit of it, it keeps you in good shape, but it doing any more cardio to really chase the ability to train is shooting yourself in the foot as to what you're getting out of that training. Like yes. you're converting fibers to slow twitch, great. Now you can do a lot of squats for no good reason at all. They just go, there's the hypertrophy signaling is just lower. So in some sense, you just got to fight that fucking dragon, man. Massing means throwing up between sets of squats. Massing slower means you don't have to do it. So it's a good thing. That's my biggest recommendation, JMO. Yeah, that was great. I think you just got to remember the specificity of training, right? Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, you're trying to gain muscle mass. You're not trying to get better intermittent recovery between sets, right? That's just like doing intermittent cardio at that point. So it's a good thought process of like, oh, I want to maintain my shape. You are maintaining your kind of intrinsic abilities. That's the good news. Like you're not actually getting worse. You're just getting heavier, right? Which yeah. means you're less efficient. You're carrying more mass, right? That's really the issue. So the, the idea here is not to get better at cardio. The, the idea is to get better at, or um, is to gain muscle mass, right? So yeah. you start training more cardio. Now you're starting to split the difference between the outcomes. So yeah. what Mike said so is about. Very, very cool. It's kind of a gift and a curse, you know, like it's, it's just, it's a part of the job. Uh, they asked Kai Green once, you know, like, so a couple, a couple of years back, it's five to 10 years back, 
he had gotten over 300 for the first time in his life. Uh, this is before he became great, right? This is on his way to greatness, right? And they're like, how do you feel at 300? He's like, on the one hand, I don't feel terrible. On the other hand, I tried doing a handstand for the first time in, since I was 300 and I broke several bones in my hand. <laughs> just like, he's like, you know, he's like, I, I'm not pretending that I like this. It just has to be done. And then, of course, he stepped on stage at 275, right? Like took second at the Olympia a bunch of times and won about 10 shows. Like he's a legend because he did what he had to do. There's everyone, every bodybuilder has ever been north of whatever body weight they liked says it sucks, but it, you know, the Tony is just part of the process. Like you watch the videos of Charlie Jung, like vomiting between sets of everything. Like that's just what it takes. Yeah. yeah. And just, just to reiterate, and I'm beating the horse dead here, but just to reiterate, just because you're gaining weight doesn't mean you're in losing that conditioning that you have. It just means that you're just heavier and shittier yeah. and less efficient. You're just expending more energy to do the same task. So it's kind yeah. of a misnomer when people say, like, I lost conditioning. It's like, now nah, you're just heavier, right? It just co costs yeah. you more to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, when you see someone running uphill with a backpack and they're huffing and puffing, you're like, that guy's in shitty shape. You're like, no, he's a backpack on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's same idea, exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is just real quick to say that, like, strong men at a high level are so impressive because they weigh 400 pounds oh, yeah. and they're running around with kegs. You're like, oh, my God, dude. Like, how many people weigh 400 can move? It's, it's insane. And not just, like, blow their Achilles off. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Christian Wisman. Wisman uh, I, could, says, I couldn't do the, the correct, uh, you know, uh, figure. He has the, like, B looking, like, the beta looking. Ooh. The very German spelling. So I, I couldn't do the figure, but... I did yeah. it the American way. It's like Christian Wissmann. That's like, to me, it sounds like a World War II German admiral. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, very respected by the British. Like, oh, he's dangerous. <laughs> he was like the Red Baron. Exactly. But not <laughs> on as many snack foods. <laughs> um, that's, it's so funny. Like, you know, you like shoot a bunch of people down, you die for your country and you like teleport you forward in time. They're like, do people remember my greatness? They're like, yeah, you have a line of popcorn named after you now. It's like, yeah. what's popcorn? Like, eh, you don't want to know. And pizza, frozen pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so I could just see like, yeah, that's right. The, the, the year is 2581 and everyone eats Huffmanistani crab cakes. You're like, God damn it. Fuck. <laughs> really? That's what I'm going for. <laughs> that's like, my oh, legacy. God. People stop you in the airport, the spaceport. They're like, James Hoffman? You're like, yep, I got brought back to life. They're like, I love your crab cakes. They're not my fucking like, crab cakes. No, RP, RP, right, James? <laughs> Damn it. They're like, RP died during the Renaissance Wars in 2084. You're like, oh, shit, I knew it. I knew Nick Shaw was going to get greedy with that goddamn octopus. The ironically named Renaissance Wars. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we lost the Renaissance Wars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Two topics. Number one, injury prevention. I injured my triceps tendon on my elbow uh, this spring and got treated with extracorporeal shockwave therapy. Holy robot. It sounds like a, a ghost treatment. <laughs> Literally. Extracorporeal. Like, yeah, it's like, now, you might see some shit. Don't worry, the ghosts are safe, I think. Um, all right, rehab and some anti-inflammatories. My physio doc told me that I can't really do anything to prevent this, but I really have a hard time believing that. Okay. How would you recommend to prehab my tendons slash joints to avoid injuries? A lot of people think prehab is not a thing. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I know I didn't always warm up properly, so this will be my first thing to change. Taking it more serious, anything besides that. So I have a couple points, and then James probably has more pertinent points. One, take your warm-up seriously. So for example, when I do skull crushers, mm -hmm. um, I often uh, begin with a compound movement first, even if triceps are my priority, because if I do heavy shoulder pressing or heavy dips, my elbows warm up to the tension in a way that like no amount of skull crush warm up can do, or like I'd have to do 10 sets or something. Once I'm done overhead pressing, my elbows are real good. Then I take like three or four warm up sets for my heavy weight and skull crushers. And I, I'm very careful. Another thing is technique. There's a variety of ways um, you can move your elbow. Can you, can you point the camera at me for a sec, James? Uh, it's it's your webcam, I'm just, my man. Oh, sorry, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Bad. Um. So, like, if you do an overhead extension and you go back this way, sometimes that shreds the living shit out of your elbows. But where you might break forward first, see how my elbow comes forward first, and then you go back. Like for me, that feels totally great. Okay. So I break and then go. But if you just start up here and you just go back, that's similar to when you're squatting. Just like not bending at your hips, just bending straight at your knees. Like you'll just shred your shit up. So 
point, point one is warm up. Point two is figure out ways of training your triceps that really feel good. This shouldn't be a thing where you're like, oh, like I know guys who just wrap up their elbows and sleeves and they're like, oh, I'm trying to train triceps. It's been cold out a lot. So it's going to oh, hurt. Like, yeah, I just don't think it's a good idea to just train stuff that hurts all the time. So that kind of stuff, making sure your technique is good so that it feels good. Um, and then going super slow in progress with volume and intensity and always paying attention to when, uh, to when stuff is hurting James. Yeah, those are really good suggestions. The only ones I would add on top of what Mike said was you might choose exercises that favor a little bit more range of motion over load. So for example, um, not just doing uh, like super, super heavy skull crushers, which people tend to load up pretty heavy because they can do a lot. Maybe do like a really good full range of motion cable press down, which you can go all the way up like palm to face, peak contraction on the way down, or um, sometimes even like the overhead barbell movements just because it's a little more awkward for people. Dumbbell skull crushers. Dumbbells, yeah. You just can't use as much weight because it's awkward, right? So, and you get a nice full range of motion. Something along those lines. Even a JM press, you can't uh, use nearly as much weight as if you just did a raw like skull crusher uh, in a lot of cases. So I would say pick ones where you get a really good range of motion and it limits the load inherently. And then also favor the higher rep ranges for now until you can have like three to four mesocycles pain Three, not just yeah. one, right? Three to four, pain three, and that pain three, and use your know, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 rep ranges more than yeah, the great. 10. Great. And just lastly, I think I sort of implied this, but just to make it very explicit, if an exercise hurts your elbows, just don't fucking do it. Just don't fucking do it. Just go away from doing it and try it in a year or try it never. People will say to me, like, um, you know, I love close grips, I love scar crushers, I love extensions but I can't do dips. They hurt my elbows. What should I do? I'm like, is there some kind of driving force in your life that's leading you towards dips? Like you like were daydreaming while you're driving your car and you just like ran into like the dips purchasing store where it's like dip stands free. And you're like, Oh, how the hell am I here? And your wife calls. She's like, where are you? Like I'm, I'm at the dip store again, honey. She's like, that's the third time this month. Are you having the dreams again? Like who the hell needs dips? There's 50 trillion different tricep exercises. Just use the ones that are cool. I think like a lot of people, like I'll, I'll post a video where I do dips or something, where I do skull crushers. And inevitably I get several comments like, oh man, I got to start trying those. Like, do you really? Like, and if you do, maybe they're great, but maybe they hurt your elbows. Maybe they bother them. Like I literally have another kind of comment, but man, I try to do dips, but my triceps hurt. Any ideas? I'm like, yes, I'm fucking doing dips. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> and then if you try them again, try them with persistence and try them in a bunch of different hand positions and shoulder positions to make it that they don't hurt. And if you spend two or three weeks trying a bunch of stuff and they still hurt, just don't ever do them, man. There's a bunch of exercises I'll never do that hurt. Like I just, just dumb to do. Why the hell would I do them? Don't do them. So make sure you just, if, if you, all you need for big triceps is one tricep exercise and you can do volume intensity manipulations and get huge triceps, right? If you have three or four, amazing. You have everything you need. There's like 12 good tricep exercises. You don't need to do all of them. So just remember that. Especially like if you're not a high level bodybuilder, uh, a lot of the pressing movements, you get so much indirect oh work God, in triceps. Totally. I mean, if, if you're dealing with injury, you can just MV your triceps just by doing press work and you're basically good to go. If you're somebody like my size, that might not be the case. If you're somebody like my size, you might be able to get away with that. 100%. Okay, let me put it back. There we go. All right, number two, coming back after a long 10 weeks or more layoff, I have been out of the gym for almost 10 weeks now due to the aforementioned injury. I thought about starting full body template five days. Not a good idea. We'll tell you why in a sec. I liked it a lot additionally to, to go two or three times to my BJJ class to get back in the groove. Please give me some do's and don'ts, general advice to not get injured again due to overdoing it. Thanks in advance. Always enjoy watching the Q&A. Regards, Chris. So, Chris, check this out. Um, I would start uh, for about two or three weeks, only doing two a day split, or sorry, two a week split, do a full body Monday, full body Thursday. And then I would do a full body split that's three days a week, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full body, full body, full body. And then only after two or three months of that, when I go to a four day, and I would do a four day for several months and then do a five day for jujitsu. I would do a whole month of weight training and not even do jujitsu for a month. And then I would come back to doing two classes of mostly technique and very little, if any, rolling for another several, for another month maybe, then go to two to three classes and slowly start rolling. You easing in means easing in. Five day a week training coming back is a monstrously ridiculous idea that's gonna fucking get you hurt if you're unlucky. If you're lucky, it'll be fine, but I wouldn't design programs based on luck. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, oh, I keep forgetting to switch the screen back. 
I'm totally with Mike on that. Uh, I think maybe I might be a little bit more aggressive on the jujitsu, only in the sense of like I think you could probably do one to two times, probably more like one. Uh, if you if you are able to go and just do the technique and not get tempted into drilling and rolling, which is a hard thing. Admittedly, that's a hard sell to say like just go for the 30 minutes of technique and don't stay for the drilling and rolling like that. No one's going to do that. So in that case. If you're in that boat, then take Mike's advice and just don't go for, you know, a month or two until you have the conditioning from the weight training. You got some cardio, you got some, some local, and you're able to tolerate that a little bit better. But I think if you're able to do the little bit of the ego check and just go there just to get some basic conditioning, basic skill work back in jujitsu, I think you could probably throw that in. Yeah. I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Okay. Okay. Mercia Belai, as we call them in America, says, Hi, docs. First of all, thanks for all the information in the last webinar. I'll start training calves at MV, as Dr. James suggests, and use more weight for lower reps with shorter rest periods, as Dr. Mike suggests. Would it also be beneficial to add blood flow restriction to the mix to get a metabolite effect? Yes, I think it would be hugely beneficial yeah. because then it would really reduce the actual load on your foot. Um, or would this training modality be counterproductive to high, higher weight, low rep MV training? You know, I think it's great. I think what you might do is just do MV training for a while without it and just see how you're feeling. And then when you start expanding your volumes, make a couple of the days a week, uh, one or two of them BFR days so that you can take some stress off your foot. And that might be really, really productive for you. Yeah, totally. And that's probably one of the better instances of using BFR for hypertrophy is injury management type stuff. So totally yeah. on board. Uh, ooh, this validates my bias. So I like it. In reply to PS in reply to Tony's question, I train calves with Nike Metcons, various training shoes and barefoot. Barefoot was probably the most uncomfortable for me. Shazam. Um, barefoot training is not, it is great to develop the musculature and the strength of your feet, but it, be, it is great because it is overloading to your feet. So if someone is experiencing plantar fasciitis or any of that kind of symptomology, barefoot is not the answer. It is the problem. You need to restrict the movement of the foot as soon as the person is not symptomatic anymore. When you have broken the inflammatory cycle, potentially using barefoot training to strengthen the areas, to build up more capacity in the area is a good idea. But it's one of those that the medication and the rebuilding is two different things, right? Like when they tell you like, hey, you know, after you get done being sick, if you start working out, you'll get sick less. That doesn't mean the doctor puts your dumbass on a treadmill when you're in the hospital with the flu. Like the best thing to do when you have the flu is shut the fuck up and sit down and eat as much as you can and drink. Best thing to do when you don't have the flu to prevent the flu is to become strong and fit. And that involves challenging yourself. Two different things at different times. James? Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, I'm good. Nicely done. Sweet. All right. By the way, my last name is spelled wrong in the docs. It's Benayon, not Benayuan. Oh, damn. Damn. Getting correct. Oh. Correcting. Yeah. It's just the U and the O misplaced. Oh, that's probably just my fault. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably my fault. You're going to get the mummy's going to visit you, JMO. All right. Hey, Docs. Shit. So Isak Benayoun says, hey, Docs, I noticed that on my stiff legged deadlift, it's not my hamstrings, but my lower back that's limiting the number of reps I can perform, even though I'm crazy sore after doing those. Is that a problem? Um, it is a problem. Well, if you're getting crazy sore, it's not a fucking problem. Um, so you're good to go. Um, but potentially it can be later if you have trouble getting your hamstrings sore. So I think mm -hmm. as long as your hamstrings are getting blasted totally, um, I think for most people, like I've seen very few SLDLs where the hamstrings reach failure. You know, mostly the lower back, like if you're keeping a tight lower back, it just taxes your lower back. And at some point you're going to start to round. You usually start to round before your hamstrings go, which is one of the reasons why the SLDL is such a challenging exercise and is one of the few exercises which taking to failure is a terrible idea because it almost always because of that limiting factor being your back, technical breakdown occurs way, be, way before the point of target 
hamstring muscle failure. So it's not a problem at all. It could be a problem if you like such bad shape that your lower back is like an RIR zero while your hamstrings are an RIR 10. <laughs> um, but then you wouldn't be getting sore in your hamstrings. So I think it's not a problem in this case. Uh, JMO. Yeah, I think like, like Mike said, it could potentially be a problem if it's limiting your ability to do hamstring training. And clearly it's not in this case, but just as food for thought, if it was, I think you could make a case that your back might not have the strength and or work capacity to really benefit from that exercise. And you might be better off just doing more deadlifts or yeah. deficit deadlifts rows. for the time being. Yeah. And, yeah. Rose. And then just building that back strength until you can actually utilize the SLDL yeah. as more of an effective hamstring training tool, but it sounds like you are. So meh. Yeah. And also, if you were in that situation, you could still do SLDLs by doing a pre-exhaust of lying or seated hamstring curls before. Yeah. So you do three to three to five sets of hamstring curls close to failure. SLDLs is going to be like every rep is going to be like hamstring, 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 and you'll never even notice you had a lower back. But during that same time, because then you're making a lower back even weaker <laughs> during that same time, you want to do what James says and blast the deadlifts and all that other stuff so that your lower back is getting strong while your hamstring is still getting hit. And then eventually you might not have to pre-exhaust anymore. Yeah. And that's one of those things, like, I think just with training age kind of works itself out. Like you, you rarely run into intermediate or advanced lifters who have that problem just because their backs get so strong. So. 100%. Uh, All right. Um, also, Mike, I was. Do you, do you practice Yom Kippur? Also, I was wondering uh, do, do you practice Yom Kippur, Mike? If that's the case, have a, a good fast, I guess. Thanks in advance. Um, I do not practice Yom Kippur. My mom uh, fasted, uh, but I don't have an amicable relationship with God, so to speak, so I don't fast. Um, yeah. Fair enough. I get asked first. very similar questions because people think I'm Jewish. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> you should only Jewish in a financial sense. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, and here's another <laughs> question. <laughs> Hey, me again for one more question, please. During the last few days, I've been watching Chinese Olympic weightlifters, and I notice they don't pay a lot of attention to breathing, like they don't brace their core during their lifts or anything like that. In your experience, guys, do you think that for bodybuilding powerlifting, it's better to brace during lift as opposed to exhale, not pay much attention to your breathing technique? Thanks in advance. I think the bracing stuff pays huge dividends when you're powerlifting. Um, because you know, the loads are so great that your uh, core strength is a huge limiting factor. In weightlifting, a lot of people, you'll see they, like, they'll start pulling a snatch and they go, <sighs> like as they pull, they'll breathe in or they'll breathe out um, because they're like, your raw limit strength is usually not the issue anymore. It's speed and technique. Um, and some of them do do quite a bit of bracing at the bottom of the front squat before they stand up and stuff like that, but they're not going to brace the entire time because thinking about bracing usually means you're not thinking about technique. Powerlifting movements are super easy. The technically, uh, weightlifting movements are not. In addition to that, you can't bear down brace. You can't maintain super neutral spine like this. But when you're weightlifting, because in order to have good leverages, you actually have to get an extreme low doses at the bottom of the snatch and clean. Um, so that's one of the reasons why bracing would actually be counterproductive to the technique. So there's some, they do some bracing. Of course, everyone tightens their abs a little bit, um, tightens their core, but they don't do this over-exaggerated bracing. And they usually don't even do it when they squat because I think it's probably not super specific to the movement. Another way to think about it is the high bar back squat done raw usually bracing is not even a limiting factor for it. Like your leg strength is a limiting factor for it. Like your core can feel just fine. Your squats just don't move anymore. Um, for low bar squatting, powerlifting style, bracing is a big deal. So um, I think that um, for bodybuilding, doing too much bracing is a giant fucking waste of your time. Also for reps, if you brace between every rep, like ex excessive, extensive bracing, like, <laughs> and then do a rep in the squat, <laughs> you just end up pissing away a ton of psychic, as well as physical energy bracing. And then it's like, what about your quads? You gotta just turn into sort of like a pump rep machine where you keep a nice arched or straight lower back and you breathe in, tighten your abs, come up, breathe in, tighten your abs, come up. So the elements of bracing are still there, I think, for, uh, for, for bodybuilding. Um, but the, uh, the over-exaggerated stuff powerlifters do for excellent purposes for them, definitely not needed in bodybuilding and probably not in weightlifting. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's maybe maybe a little misnomer to say that they don't really focus on their breathing or their bracing and weightlifting because what ends up happening is they, they are uh, braced and taking usually a deep breath on the first pull. It's usually that when they hit the second pull, they just exhale 
as yeah. part of that movement, right? And so it's not that they're not focusing on the breathing. It's just they're making that big maximal effort, and that usually requires a little bit of an exhalation. And I'm with Mike on the for bodybuilding purposes. Here's the other thing. Where do you get the most benefit out of doing that brace technique in the squatting or, or you know, external load type movements? It's usually in reps that are like five or less. That's when yeah. you get the most benefit of it. How much time do you really do that in bodybuilding? Almost never. At least yeah. we don't recommend that you do it. You should usually be going six to ten on the heavy side. And if you drop below six, it's probably time for down sets. So it's really just not a good use of your time to really focus on all that bracing. What that would mean to me is you're favoring intensity too much and – spending too much, like over, um, I, don't, I don't know how to say this, but just putting too much effort into your technique at the cost of how much actual stuff you could be doing. Think yeah. about it. Like if you tried to do really heavy sets of six, like four sets of six and trying to brace each time, probably by the time you've done that, you could have actually just added like three sets of eight without, you know what I mean? That's yeah. a huge amount more volume. So I think, uh, you know, what actually really, really illustrated this point for me is actually if you guys watch Chad Wesley Smith do high rep squats, he doesn't fucking waste any time in between those reps, right? He's just like, boop, 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 boop. And they all look good. They look good. And they look amazing. And mm -hmm. he, somebody, I remember somebody asked him on a video, like, Chad, why don't you br uh, brace more in between those reps? He's just like, because I get fucking exhausted. I just want to go up and down and be done yeah. with it as fast that's as right. I can. It's like, boom, that's it. Um, so I totally agree. Yep. Great, great points. Oops. All right. Nina Yang. Says, hi, docs. Hope you're well. I'm jumping on the plantar fasciitis train last week. No. <laughs> so everyone's like an epidemic at RP+. Um, last week in response to Tony saying his calf exercises keep his uh, plantar fasciitis at bay and it flares up if he doesn't do them for a month. Mike said it was because of the fiber type conversion. Can you please explain that more? Yes, absolutely. So when you don't do things for a while, the pertinent musculature tends to revert to a faster twitch variant, which means it becomes very, very poorly resistant to fatigue. And fundamentally, plantar fasciitis in one way or another is an excess amount of fatigue locally. So if you consistently train an area, then it becomes uh, more converted to uh, a variety of things happen to it. it makes it more endurant and more quickly recoverable. One of them is fiber conversion to a slower twitch variant or average slower twitch fiber behavior that allows the fibers to really like allow recover super quick, super quick, super quick. So to illustrate this, to compare two fibers, um, the uh, muscle fibers in your forearm, many of them are very slow twitch because it requires you to fucking do stuff all the time. Um, if you start typing, uh, for the first time, and especially if you're a bigger, more muscular person, you start typing a lot. A lot of people get pumps in their forearms and literally get lactate accumulation in their hands and forearms. James, you ever had that during tests when you were writing back in school? Just like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, 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 ACTs. Uh. Awful, awful. But if you become more practiced at writing and more type practiced at typing, that tends to go away a lot. And one of the ways is through fiber conversion. So I think a lot of times when people have fatigue related maladies, a good thing to do is to get in shape, which is to say we train the area relatively regularly and not get detrained. Yeah. And I think if we want to use like our sports science kind of terms, we could, you can literally say like, you don't have enough work capacity in those tissues to tolerate the loads that you're doing. Right. And so as Mike said, it's good to do some kind of more basal exercise to build up the endurance of that tissue because the, the, the penultimate problem, the thing that you can't avoid is that whatever the load you're placing on those tissues is greater than its capacity to tolerate load. Right. That's really the big issue. Yep. So you have to build it up by developing more capacity and then you can move on to doing more training. Yep. Okay. All right. Benjamin Conrad says, oh hi, James and Harry Muscle Daddy. No God boy. damn Instagram seeping in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> number one, last week when discussing volume from strength mesos, James mentioned when starting a strength block after I purchased a block, the minimum effective volume for that first meso would be particularly low. Chad Wesley Smith in his program design manual recommends starting a strength meso after I purchased a meso with around the same number of sets uh, that the hypertrophy meso ended at, or perhaps 10% less, does this mean you disagree? I thought the reasoning for starting a higher volume post-hypertrophy would be to make use of the very high level of fitness or work capacity. So you have a specific work, your general work capacity is very high after hypertrophy block, but your specific work capacity for very low rep sets uh, might not be as good. Uh, so I think that if you start with the same number of sets, that's good, but you got to remember that's like half the ma mathematical volume because you're cutting the reps by a huge factor. As a matter of fact, a lot of hypertrophy work occurs in the six to 10 rep range 
a lot of strength work occurs in the three to five rep range. That's basically half the volume. Uh, and it's just a slight increase in intensity, maybe 15%. Um, and then Chad says 10% less. I think that's right on the money. Um, so uh, there is an argument um, that when you, uh, it, it really depends on how heavy you go in that first strength block. Um, if it's just one strength block you're going to be doing, you're going pretty heavy right off the bat. I would say start on the lower end of the volumes because you're just not used to the weights that heavy. Um, if you're starting at the higher ends of the, uh, 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 sorry, if you're starting at the lower ends of the intensity range, I think it's fine to do a very similar number of sets that you started your last mesocycle at for hypertrophy. So for example, if you do an average of uh, eight rep sets for your hypertrophy phase, you have sort of two options when you stop and go to a strength phase. One is an average of six rep sets for a strength phase. That's kind of a in, in between strength and hypertrophy kind of transitional phase. Or you can go right to an average of four reps, like sets of three to five. If you go right to four, I would say the number of sets should be lower uh, because it's real shocking. Um, but also you don't need much work capacity for that kind of stuff. And, and then in addition to that, if you do sec sets of six sets, or sorry, uh, sets of an average of uh, six reps, I think it's totally fine to transition to a relatively similar number of sets, although I would be erring on the side of taking Chad's advice at 10% lower. Yeah, so I think there might be a little confusion in what we were talking about, right? So what we were talking about was the MEV on the first mesocycle coming off of hypertrophy. So what we were saying is because you are probably making some substantial exercise changes and some load changes, the MEV goes down. But what we also said is that it's going to come up. That's probably going to be one of the only times that you see an actual increase in the volume of the programming after those first couple of weeks. So the idea here is not that you have built up a ton of work capacity and now you need to train at really, really high strength volumes. The idea is that you don't have to. Remember, we're saying the MEV, right? The minimum effective volume. We're not saying the MAV or the MRV. We're saying the amount you need to get going on a strength phase is very low. And so you can take advantage of that by starting low and then taking a very modest volume progression up after a week or two, and then you're basically in your MAV range, right, which is pretty low. Now, I don't agree on the notion that you can go tit for tat with what you were doing on a hypertrophy phase. For example, let's just take a very run-of-the-mill, like a kind of meso-2 type hypertrophy mesocycle. What kind of stuff might you be doing? Uh, feel free if you think this is a, a stretch or a obnoxious, but let's say you had a quad day. You might do something like 10 sets of quads at mm -hmm. kind of at the end and maybe yeah. six maybe six sets of those were squats and maybe four sets were something else um are you going to tell me that when you transition immediately into strength that you're going to start doing six sets of five ten Probably. sets of five <laughs> yeah I, I i'm being generous saying we'll, we'll go tit for tat on the squats but not even the whole quad volume right the right. whole quad volume would be ten sets of five absolutely right. six yeah. sets of five on the squats still too much so what we're saying is you might only have to do three sets of five to get a good strength stimulus because of the novelty of the load and maybe the exercise changes if you were doing close stance squats and now your high bar squats or your high bar and now your low bar, whatever, right? You might only need like three, two to three sets and then you might have to ramp it up a little bit. But what we were saying before is that from that point on, you probably won't do any volume progressions. And then from that point, you're we're probably very close to those Chad's recommendations of 90% once you have yep. done that initial ramp up. So just keep yep. in mind the MAV and the MEV are two different things. We're just saying in that first couple of weeks in that transition, you don't need to do a lot. You can benefit from very little. Boom. Okay. Uh, number two, when discussing volume from strength mesos last week, you seem to be suggesting, at least in your examples, doing sets of five reps for the entire first meso, and then assuming decreasing perhaps in two to three as the strength log progresses, i.e. periodizing the rep ranges across the block. I've always programmed strength mesos themselves to progress from five to six down to two to three within the meso, making intensity jumps each week that force that decrease. Do you think there's a preferable option? Uh, much love, Benjamin. Uh, so one of the things that's constrained by your time course, like how long do you have until you meet? But I think if you optimally, you would take two to three strength mesocycles before a peaking mesocycle. I'm a huge fan of starting in the four to six rep range or even g in the five to seven rep range yep. for a meso yep. next meso in the um four to six range and then the meso after that in the three to five range right and then you know that three to five or is the the last meso of strength after that it's peaking you can even go you know two to four range although that's really close to sort of peaking 
Um, so I would say that, that, you know, it really lets you milk out each phase and build a ton of basic strength. I think that within a strength mezzo, you can go from sets of six down to sets of three. Um, one thing is that it's a little bit of a, it's not a violation of direct adaptation, but it doesn't milk it out as much as it can. Like lots of sets, a like month of sets of five does wonders for strength development because it really lets you groove into sets of five and milk it the fuck out. And two, sometimes the intensity increases uh, going from sets of six all the way down to sets of three, especially if you're pretty strong. For someone like Charlie John or, or uh, you know, Chad Wesley Smith, sets of six, two sets of three is like 100 to 200 pounds difference. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. I, you know, I don't even know what that looks like week to week as far as increases. There are times like that, but those are by Chad and by Charlie intentionally leaving sort of transition on mesocycles. Like that's transitioning from strength to peaking. That's not a, a lot of time strength. Now, there is a, a way to do it with sort of like a, um, uh, a DUP type of thing where, you know, Mondays you do sets of seven. Uh, just an example. Wednesday you do sets of five. Friday you do sets of three. I think that's totally cool, but then the next block you might do, you know, six four two, and the next block you might do four three two. Like then, still over the blocks, it gets a little heavier. And even though there's heavy days and moderate days and light days every week, you're used to them happening every week. Um, but if you do like, you know, first week six six six, next week five five five, next week four four four, next week three three three, deload. That's really aggressive, uh, and I, I think it's fine. I think it's good. I don't think it's optimal. And I think it's a little risky and uh, doesn't allow direct adaptation to occur as a uh, cook for as long as I'd like, James. So I agree with all those points. I would love to add that um, going from like six reps to, to like two to three reps, as Mike said, for strong people might be the difference of over a hundred pounds. So you might be thinking, so what, right? But this is huge implications for your mesocycle because that's going to impact how much volume you can tolerate or how much, if you're going to do a volume progression at all, you might actually be doing a volume regression at that point, which is kind of weird. And on the other note, that might actually affect your frequency of training. So now we actually have two huge variables, right? If you're squatting 100 pounds more than you usually do, you might not be able to squat uh, every week. You might have to squat it's every other program. week. It's a different program. It's a different program every two weeks. Yeah. Exactly. So now you have a completely different program, basically, because the volume's changing, the frequency's changing, the intensity's changing. It's too many things changing at once to actually track and program. And to me, what is a meaningful way? So I agree with everything that Mike said, and then you also run into programming and tracking nightmares where you're just like, am I actually making progress, or am I just changing the rep ranges across these weeks? You know, I actually have no idea at this point. So I'm not a huge fan. I think it's okay. I think you can get by doing that, but I'm more, I guess this would be more of like a traditional strength and conditioning approach where you kind of have a, a target rep goal, whether that's an average of four, you know, using three to five as a range, you say my average is yeah. four, that's what I'm shooting yeah. for. I'm more in favor of doing that than going across and changing the two. On a, just on last note, because I almost on an emotional or psychological note, I think a lot of the way that people end up designing training blocks like that, or not I was designing as a charitable term, end up running into training blocks like that, is they, they're sort of like, oh, I'm in a strength block. Let's get to twos real quick. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, oh. like you're a peaking block now, and a lot of people don't even differentiate between strength and peak. Like strength, that means one or ends, right? It's like, no, it doesn't. Um, one of the reasons that the programs based around five are so good and so they deliver, you know, strong lifts five by five, grip it toes three by five, there's something real magical about spending months at a similar rep range and just milking that shit. Like I've seen people do squats with 500 pounds for sets of five. And they just did sets of three to five for three months. And now they're doing 550 for fucking sets of five. And you're like, oh my God, what is their one rep max up by? A lot. But if you do five, three, two, one peak, it's like, okay, like, I don't know how much strength you actually built. A lot of the energy there is to, for transitioning. And remember your technique with sets of five is very different than sets of two. The amount of bracing, the number of steps you take out from the rack is huge. And you might end up not getting the best kind of training because here's, look at it this way your set of two that you're going to do, how used to sets of two are you? Well, you're not at all. Last week you did sets of four and the week before you did sets of six. So what would you really have to do to get a great double is for a month, you have to do roughly sets of two. Uh, the first week's going to suck. The second week's you're figuring shit out. The third week you feel the fucking great. The fourth week you hit huge PRs with doubles because you are doubles at that point. You know everything there is to know about doing doubles. 
you know, to set up your body, you know how to breathe, you know how to step out of the rack, you know how to set up your hands for the deadlift. But, you know, if you transition super quick like that, it basically is, is a directed adaptation violation to some extent. It's not optimal. Yeah, totally with you. All right, I'm going to... Liam Browning. Um, hey, Docs, new RP Plus member here exclamation mark in parentheses. And I plan on competing in my first bodybuilding show in about 18 months. For a bit of background, I'm 20 and have been lifting with moderate volume for four years with a focus on powerlifting specific training for the past two years. At the moment, I'm about 12 to 15% body fat at 170 pounds. I'm currently in the midst of a strength meso since I'm eight weeks out from powerlifting meat and I plan on massing for a few months after that. However, not exactly sure how to best situate myself in the following months before the start of contest prep late next year, do you guys have any advice creating a roadmap to a show when you're this far out? Any input would be appreciated. I have great advice. What I think you should do is after the meet, do your mass phase, so on and so forth, then do um, as long of a cutting phase as it takes to get down to around 10% fat. Uh, as, so as long as it's not more than like three or four months. And I think you're well within that range. Um, once you've done that cutting phase, take like three to four months of my of maintenance same body weight train to the first two or three months of that good hypertrophy training targeting your weak points and then well, the last month should be like some combination of low volume slash active rest and then at the end of that process you're right around 10 percent body fat maybe a little higher but you quickly lose a bunch of fat when you start training hard again and you're ready to start your show diet right around 10% body fat and you're super fatigue reduced you for the last month of the either active resting for some weeks or training with low volumes. Now you're ready to start with MEV volumes, slowly ramp them up or not even let the diet hit you and you'll be ready for your first show. So I think that's how to approach that one. That's rock solid in my book. James, you don't know how to read. I don't. Yeah. Um, Carl VG. Wouldn't it be hilarious if his name was Carl VD? I was thinking the same thing. I was like, Carl, vagina, gynecomastia. <laughs> your vagina has gyno, sir. I don't know how it <laughs> happened, but whatever you're taking is terrible. Um, you know, what's, uh, I was actually asking my wife this, and we didn't know offhand. Um, is uh, venereal disease, uh, is that term venereal literally a throwback to the Venusian, like Venus, goddess of love? Is that, is that what that is? Because it's not to do with know. veins. That's, a, that's actually, I think that's probably the closest thing to anything that's yeah. made sense that I've ever heard. You know, like for a while. They don't use that actually, medicine anymore, apparently. No, and actually like uh, uh, STDs, I guess, was not like a PC thing to say anymore. STIs. STIs, yeah. Mm. I was corrected uh, a while ago. I don't remember why, what the context was, uh, mm. but somebody was like, no, you don't say that anymore. No, um, I say that. You can say whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, I was just like, okay, whatever. You know, uh, <laughs> I, was about to, I was about to give other examples of things that are not PC to say anymore, but I'm going to bite my tongue. Let's shut the fuck up. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'll be an, a new episode called Examples of Shit Not to Say. Um, there'll be a lot of quiet. Uh, number one, what would generally be the minimum amount? Oh, actually, uh, just uh, for the YouTube announcement, um, I think every now and again we'll have Marcos Rodriguez on here to do a little sports scientist reunion, and that won't be a very informative episode at all. That'll just be uh, full of making fun of all of you. Mostly so, STI nice. related content. Yeah, Marcos knows a lot of that. Um, <laughs> number one, would generally, what would generally be the minimum amount of cardiovascular work, biking, walking on an incline treadmill, one could do? to get the most of the health benefits without doing too much work, which would impede systemic reto- recovery and leg training, which intensity are most efficacious for improving the lipid panel. So the lipid panel intensity is an easy question. The harder you train, the more it improves. And uh, up to a point of incredible overtraining, the more you train, the better your lipid panel improves. Um, so that's easy. Uh, but I would say that for many people, uh, any more than four sessions of relatively low intensity, cardio max heart rate of 120, four sessions of 45 minutes per week is I think in the realm of many people to recover from great and maybe even see some enhancements in some areas and definitely great for health. When I've seen in my experience, people push it beyond four sessions, 45 minutes in length of that kind of cardio or do harder cardio, they start paying real live decrements in their leg training. James? 
Yeah, and so the question kind of revolved around the minimum, I think, that he was saying. And so if you look at, like, the ACSM oh, guidelines... fuck, I answered uh, the maximum. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm glad you did, though. That gives us a good thing to talk about. Because if you look at, like, the ACSM guidelines, they've actually shown that like, it's, like, 10 minutes two times a week is actually, like, mm -hmm. the minimum threshold you it's need. It's going to register. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, if you're somebody who basically doesn't move around outside of lifting for sets of five... Uh, yeah, those two times 10 minutes of incline walking is going to be great. It's going to be a tangibly different thing for you. Yeah. But for most people who do like hypertrophy training, I would uh, say probably more like two times 20 minutes per session per week for minimum effective yep. dose. Yeah. And I, and I will also say like, I think if you're serious about improving your health, uh, three times 30 minutes per week is like, don't fiddle around with anything much less than that. Because you go to your doctor again, six months later, and he'll be like, yeah, your lipids are okay, but they could be better. And you could be like, well... I guess I should have just gotten serious, you know, don't fuck around with this kind of stuff. Yeah. And sometimes also lipids, get leaner. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I was going to say the lipids could be genetic or just body fat related. Like it might not be a cardio thing. It might be, a, you just need to take drugs because you have chronic, you know, lipid problems, totally. just genetic. Yeah. So yeah. who knows? Oh, we did that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Regular curling variations, barbell, easy bar curls, and even cable curls to some extent have become very stale for me and especially barbell curls have started irritating my biceps a little in a bad way. Preacher curls and incline cable curls feel amazing and have great SFRs for me. Would sticking to only preacher curls and incline cable curls for one to two massing muscles be a good idea? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Or would you guys recommend always doing traditional curling variations sometimes? No, fuck no. Oh, there's no. nothing magical about those shits, dude. You could even do like incline dumbbell curls or Bayesian curls or a bunch, bunch of shit. Just do this somehow fucking move your arm in a way that activates your bicep is good enough. Yeah. And I think the take home point here is that SFR is not a blanket thing that applies to everybody. Meaning like these are, you can't just say like barbell curls are a high SFR exercise necessarily. No. Right? It's always on an individual basis based yeah. on how the person responds, their technique, their limb lengths, their mind muscle, all those things. So if you have high SFR exercises, use them and don't yeah. use the ones that cause you pain. <laughs> That's I, the simplest recommendation. 100%. I forgot the person, uh, I think someone asked this on here, uh, or maybe they asked this on Instagram. I, I don't remember, but I got a question relatively recently where they, were, they asked, um, you know, Mike, are you, when are you going to, are you going to publish a list of exercises ranked by SFR? And I said that that list is never coming because it's theoretically untenable. There is no such list. Like I can tell you leg presses have high SFR for me, but leg extensions might, oh, actually it was on here because James and I were talking about leg extensions for you have a great stimulus to fatigue ratio. For me, there's just total dog shit. So there is no list like that. It's all individual. Now there's generally speaking, compound basics have higher SFRs than just trash movements that are fucking awful. Uh, like good technique and stuff. But outside of that, it's really been really up to the individual. And another thing is like, we could publish averages of SFRs, but they would have so many outliers. It would just be a huge disservice. It's, it's almost like um, publishing a list of like uh, must eat restaurants in Toronto or something. It's God like, damn it. I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's like, I was yeah, like, you know, they're good restaurants, but so, so many people are going to go there and be like, this sucks. Right. Like we're there's the actual list of good restaurants is a thousand deep. You can't just pick 10, you know? Yeah. I was going to say listing, like these are the top movies you need to see. Same idea. Like it's like, yeah. What are the best movies? That's a great. Eh, yeah. Same the answer idea. to that is Forrest Gump. But. End of discussion. Done. Yeah. Moving on. Um, okay. So then he gives some examples here. Uh, programming would look something like this for the upcoming mesos day one preacher easy bar curls for six to 10 reps day two incline cable 10 to 20 uh day four preacher easy bar curls 10 to 20 day five incline cable 20 to 30 it looks fucking great yeah that's good i would say you might benefit from having another variation like maybe do like a dumbbell preacher instead uh but yeah. that's as written it's also great super great number three are glute ham raises generally a good movement for hamstrings in a massing meso, I personally get a very deep stretch with a crazy contraction at the top. I'm just looking for your opinion, guys, since I haven't heard you speak on them much. I think they're super great. You have to learn how to do them properly. So many okay. people fuck up that exercise. I don't even know how to do it properly, so I never do it. Um, although we're going to have a list of, we already filmed a list of exercises that are RP approved. Jared Feather is doing the glute ham raises in there. He's doing them super right. You basically bend almost exclusively at the knee. Um, uh, and it's a great movement. Just make sure your technique is good. Standardize it. And I think it's good to go. Yeah, I think if, if the 45 degree back raise is a good movement for you, then the GHR generally will also be one because it's mostly the same movement, just with different yeah. leveraging. If the 45 is like one that's just always been trash for you, it's probably going to be trash for you as well. So yeah. you could just move on to something else. 
but again, it's an SFR thing. Like right. our, our individuals are mad as just dog shit. Yeah, like you know, if you like it, you like it. Um, all right, Robert Gilashvili. Robert takes his ancestry uh, from Georgia. Not hey, Georgia man, but the uh, Soviet former Republic of Georgia. Like, I, I love that. That's, you that. that's a spicy name, Gilashvili. <laughs> he, he seems like uh, it's everyone in Georgia is either a world champion weightlifter, arm wrestler, or actual wrestler. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say a Game of Thrones person. <laughs> yeah, easy. Um, the country of Georgia has the greatest uh, wrestling team in reference to their population. So they'll usually have several people medal at the Olympics, but I think the entire country of Georgia has like 6 million people. It like, doesn't make any goddamn sense. Yeah, just like a super if, huge density yeah, of wrestlers. Yeah, <laughs> it's sweet because they're all like, they, they make me look hairless. Like they're all hairy as fuck and just wrestle ever since they're three. Amazing. Yeah, if you want to go to, if you think you're a good wrestler, go to Georgia and go to like a kid's wrestling camp. Just get tooled up. You're like, fuck. Oh my God. Out. Did you watch the last UFC event? No. Okay, the, one of the fighters on there, uh, his name was Akman. Uh, I forgot his first name. I remember his last name was like Akman or something like that. Dude was like just covered in hair. He had like a hair tramp stamp on his back. Amazing. It was all curly, right? And you could yeah. tell he had like shaved his neck down because it was like he would have just been Wolfman had he yeah. not done something. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was like, this guy's a hairy beast. It was funny. How did you do? Uh, I honestly forgot. I don't remember. <laughs> I was so taken aback by how hairy he was. <laughs> All right. What's, uh, what does Robert say? Okay. Would there be any benefits slash advantages to back off sets rather than straight sets for hypertrophy? Um, also, is there a number of sets of one exercise which you'd better, better off moving to a different one or a number which you'd no longer be getting ideal tension due to going too light for straight sets, for example, getting great stimulus on a five by 10 bench press, but not needing to go too light in order to complete six by 10. So the thing is like uh, the range of acceptable stimulus for uh, intensity is so big, it's down to about 30% of your one or max. That that's not gonna be usually what stops you here. Mind muscle connection and the ability to do good technique usually degrades in our observation at RP and the observations of many people at something far north of five sets. So you can do squats for five sets. You can do them for six, seven, and eight sets. I've seen very few people do more than eight sets of squats and still report a good mind-muscle connection, a good pump, and a good technique in set number nine. Uh, down sets can help because a lot of times when you reduce the load, you have a potentiation effect and you can focus much more on the technique and the mind-muscle connection. So a four by 10 squat followed by a four by 10 squat at 20% less can make both very effective, but because our usually, unless you train in your garage, you have a lot of different variations. I don't like to program more than, you know, uh, five to eight sets per exercise. And when you think about optimal hypertrophy occurs at most between 10 to 15 sets per session. If you have two exercises in a session, each one is seven to eight sets. That's it. That's all you're. That's all you're ever going to need to do in a single session. So that's why when James and I people ask, like, how many exercises do you do per session per muscle group? The answer is one to three, because you know usually three exercises means potentially five sets of each, fifteen total sets. Motherfucker, what you doing after that in the session? I love when people are like twenty sets today for chest. Like, shut up. <laughs> Like, what is it that you had after set 15? You're joking yourself, right? Just go home, relax, and come, home, come back to the gym a couple of days earlier. So I would say play it by ear, feel out the SFR, how good are your pumps, my muscle connection, how good is your technique, uh, and be prepared that after somewhere after five to eight sets of the same exercise, shit might go south for you. So I would program in advance knowing that. So I would start like back day could be um, – you know, let's say it's all rowing that day. You could do barbell rows for two to, you know, two to three sets and cable rows for two to three sets and then sort of increase both of them as you need to keep going until you're doing 12 total sets, six each or whatever, five and seven. Uh, James? Yeah, that's really good advice. So I think kind of, as Mike already explained, since the hypertrophy range is so large, like the difference between the load you use between five by 10 and six by 10 is kind of not a huge deal. But a kind of more pertinent point is the uh, relative intensity that you use in those zones. So the thing is like, in order to maintain uh, six by 10, 
that means you're probably going to be like five, six RIR <laughs> on that first set. And That's why straight sets get, are kind of stupid anyway. Right. And so what you're missing out, it's not so much that the absolute intensity is too low, that you're not getting robust growth. It's that the relative intensity is too low in order for you to maintain a straight six by 10. That's the bigger problem there. Um, and then also kind of getting to Mike's point, when people start having like three exercises per muscle group per session, they start to wonder like, you know, maybe you aren't actually getting a good SFR on the exercises that you're choosing. So for me, like it, one to two is kind of a sweet spot. Like if you can use mm -hmm. one and just run, like for me, I can do a um, uh, camber bar bench. That's my chest day for one of my mm -hmm. chest days. That's, That's it. it. That's it. Right. Now there's definitely a need for more advanced guys. I think for, for, because they're <laughs> that usually they're lifting loads that are so crazy or they're just so in tune with everything that they get two or three sets. And then it's like, okay, these are going to, break something's gonna break i gotta move on to something else right do this for two or three sets okay something else is gonna break i gotta move that's fine right for the intermediate lifters more than two exercises when you're doing like three by three sets of five per muscle group three exercises five sets each per muscle group i start to give the little wonky eye on that one like are you actually doing a good job on those exercises or are you just filling things up to kind of kill time or kill energy i think you might be better off just doing one to two pick some heavy hitters and then be done with it Otherwise, yeah. it just seems like you're just wasting time. Yeah, 100%. Well, 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 my friend. I think that's it for this week. To the live? No live. Josh T. Brad has been with us basically the whole time, but he's the only, only one, I think, because we did the alternate uh, schedule. Which yeah, that's right. My bad. So uh, just to reiterate before we wrap things up, guys, first off, my bad for being on Thursday this week. I was traveling. I forgot to mention it last time. Second, sorry if the audio and the video quality on my end wasn't very good. I'm using Looks good here. Headphones. Okay, great. Um, three, we are going to be switching formats a little bit. RP Plus, you just keep doing the same things you normally do. Keep sending in questions. We might start funneling them a little bit if it gets really lengthy. We're also going to be entertaining some YouTube questions from now on because we're going to post a lot of these videos, if not all of them, to YouTube as well. And if we see some really thoughtful, insightful comments on YouTube, we might take zero to three of them. But RP Plus is going to be the main place. If you want to have your questions answered, just keep doing what you're doing. And if you're on YouTube and you send a good question and you say, hey, I really like what they're doing, check out RP Plus, and then you can always get your questions answered as well. Boom. All right, That's guys. It. I, okay, so I'm going to shoot myself in the foot by saying I think we're on again. There's normal time, normal channel for next week. But I think – Let's see. We go to Ireland on Thursday. So we're go to Ireland on Thursday. That's mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's right. Check it out. So if we're guys are in the Dublin, if you guys are in Dublin next week, we're gonna be there live. Uh, the details are on the RP Plus website. There's a seminars uh, page. You can check out the details there. So if you want to check us out, you're in the UK. We'll be in Dublin next week. So yeah, same time for the webinar at the Tuesday, 7:30 Eastern time, 4:30 California time, I think. Yes. All right. Peace, homies. Later. See you next time.